since when should doctors be the ultimate arbiters of what is good for society? But it's got to be in a way that enables him to be a good doctor. One of the imperatives that has got to become for medicine to use its genius one more time and bring the cost of some of this down. We might have to look back and say some of these things are not worthwhile and should not be done. And that is the hardest thing to come by. When I was 11 years old, my father died of pneumococcal meningitis. Physicians always tell me that if he had contracted that disease today, antibiotics, penicillin could have cured him. In my lifetime, we've conquered polio with the Salk and Sabin vaccines and virtually wiped out smallpox and measles. But we still haven't cured the common cold. We haven't found the key to cancer. And now medicine is desperately searching for an answer to the newest bafflement, AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. How can we manage without a vaccine or a cure for this new and deadly disease? That's the question in our hypothetical case study. It's a question not just for AIDS doctors and their patients, but for each of us. The moderator is Professor Arthur Miller of the Harvard Law School. Welcome to Metropolis. Congressman, Metropolis is your district. And when you're at home in Metropolis, where you have your district headquarters, you and a couple of the aides of yours tend to go to Leo's place for lunch. It's a watering hole where all the biggies go. Today, it's a beautiful spring morning and you and a couple of the assistants are going out to lunch. One of them sort of takes you aside and says, uh, boss, maybe we'd better not go to Leo's place. A couple of the medical officers from the city, they ate over there the other day, and they told me that one of those waiters has all the signs of AIDS. Safer, let's go to the Italian place up the street. There's a greater chance we'll get killed driving to Leo's than many of us will get AIDS from that waiter, assuming that we keep our relationship the one of eating. You're not afraid to go to Leo's? Not for the reasons you described. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Mr. Mayor? A food handler can't possibly uh, pass it on simply by handling the food, but even though you might be squeamish about it, I mean, it's just normal to be squeamish about it, you still have an obligation to lead, to educate, and therefore to go to that particular restaurant. You're his chief medical, medical officer. Should he be so confident? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I would think that he's doing precisely the right thing to avoid creating any unnecessary fears. In fact, every day, all the information available reinforces the position that he's taking that is simply not a route of transmission. The rule is it simply doesn't occur except through very, very close, intimate sexual uh, activity. Well, despite the fact that the congressman and the mayor are still going to Leo's place, the word about Sam Server's AIDS is circulating and business is falling off. Mr. Hentoff, you, in addition to writing in the Metropolis Daily, you own Leo's place. Let's get your reaction as proprietor. As proprietor, I would have a talk with my waiter. With Sam? With Sam. Have the talk. Sam, uh, as I'm sure you know, there are these reports about you, and as I'm sure you also know, the reports have led to a calamitous fall in business. But the primary thing, it seems to me, is you at the moment. Uh, how do you feel? Have you seen a doctor? And I would urge, uh, with as much persuasiveness as I could, that he do that. You want me to see a doctor? Yeah. I certainly do. I, I, you know, I haven't been feeling too well. Yeah. And um, it's true, I have AIDS. Oh, you but, do have AIDS? Yeah, I do have AIDS. Well, in that case, I would um, 
then have to consult very quickly the local public health officials. Because it seems to me that Sam is now a problem not only of my restaurant, but of the community as a whole. Well, you've heard what the public health people will say. Want to repeat it? Well, as the chief public health officer, I did a very good job in educating the mayor and the congressman. Now I have to educate the public. Now you have to educate him. Mm -hmm. That's part of the public. What I'm trying to say is, you don't, as a layman, I don't know whom to believe. What do you do? As the owner of Leo's place, as you're watching business go out the door, and you have an AIDS-affected waiter, mm -hmm. what do you do? Well, what I would do then is try to find the best physician and treatment center in Metropolis. Tell the waiter that he's got full salary, that he doesn't have to worry about anything. And then I, I would try to persuade him to, to go into this treatment. But you'd get him out of your dining room? Yeah, I would. Congressman? There was a time in this country where it was widespread belief that if you had cancer, you could catch it by associating yourself with someone who had cancer. Now, some people may still believe that, but most people reject that idea. But let's say there was a belief in Metropolis that a cancer a patient who worked in that restaurant uh, could uh, transmit the disease. Now, the belief that the public may have may lead to the, uh, the economic loss of the restaurant owner. And then we've got to educate the public, not feed or give in to irrational prejudice. Ms. Goodman, what are you going to tell your readers? I'm going to write about it in a larger context, probably. I'm going to take Sam as an example, Sam and uh, Matt as an example of what's going on and talk about uh, exactly the things that we we're chatting about, how this is an ir irrational fear and how we have to do something about resolving the uh, irrational fear rather than closing down uh, the restaurant. Now you're going to call, you're going to call Nat's concern about the possibility of casual transmission irrational. I'm going to go with the medical experts on this one. What about, what about Science Magazine, which said last uh, winter that the disease keeps changing its character, so it's almost impossible to be sure about almost anything concerning it? Well, I'm going to go with the, uh, I figure that the medical people are at least three years ahead of me on this one, and I'm going to go with them. Let me give you a different story, Ms. Spencer. There's somebody else in Metropolis. His name is Freddie Flyer. He's from the community, went to the State University, All-American, led the team to two Super Bowls. He's now a headmaster in the community, athletes for Christ, great figure. It turns out, you hear, or the way journalists hear things, that this extended uh, overseas trip that Freddie's on is in France. He has a... His wife is at home. Talk to her. Uh, Mrs. Flyer, um, this is a difficult subject to approach, but we have reliable reports that uh, your husband, who's something of a pillar in this community, is in Paris being treated for AIDS. Is this true? The sad truth, Ms. Spencer, is that it is. He, uh, he has AIDS. He's at the Pasteur. He's hoping to get better. And uh, when did you first know that he had AIDS? Um, a couple of months ago when we uh, realized how he got it. And how did he get it? Well, as you know, we, we're deeply religious people, and we always go to church. And one of our uh, fellow religionists had AIDS, and we always sat near each other in the church. Freddie... Uh, on a number of occasions uh, took communion right after this other unfortunate soul did. So uh, there's no question uh, in, in our minds that uh, he got the AIDS from the communion cup. Mrs. Flyer, as far as, as medical evidence is, uh, is aware, this, this really wouldn't be possible. Is, is this What's your story up? tonight? I'll give that, you 42 seconds. That this one. one of the most prominent and well-known citizens of Metropolis uh, has been diagnosed as having AIDS, uh, what his prognosis is, what his, um, what his 
belief is, as far as uh, what he says, the reason is that he's You're going today. to include that in the story? Yes. Along with a caveat that this would be the first known communion communicated case <laughs> of AIDS. <laughs> I assume you will have a counter clip from Chin or Dowdle or Krim debunking it. Uh, in my 42 seconds, I'm not sure realistically that I would... Uh, that I would spend all that much time the first night this story broke debunking the communion communication theory. Uh, it certainly would be pointed out that, that this has never happened before and that this would be somewhat suspect. Does that bother you, Mr. Levy? That that's the way it's going to be broadcast this evening? I think it does. Uh, I think you could be reinforcing a lot of negative uh, perceptions about AIDS. Um, and incorrect perceptions about AIDS or how it's transmitted. If you do not spend time in, that, in those 42 seconds actively debunking the myth that AIDS can be, that HCLV3 can be transmitted through a communion cup, uh, you're going to have a lot of frightened people in your community and you'll have a lot of stories the following days about how panicked people are. Realistically, in 42 seconds, I think it's unlikely that that first piece is going to be able to spend an enormous amount of time on that because you have such a limited amount of time. How do you know the Communion Cup story is false? You, you dismissed it, and the fact is, the darn stuff probably came out of the Green Monkey. Now, how would, how would American television have covered the first AIDS victim if they said, you know, I think this may have come from a monkey? I mean, the fact is that while I would say statistically a, a particular server is not likely to give you AIDS, AIDS is a virus about which we know remarkably little. It has been in the human population a very short time, and it is conceivable that a non-scientist not bounded by the assumptions of a particular elite may in fact be telling you the truth about a disease we don't know very well. So I'm not so sure you should automatically assume that this uh, woman is necessarily wrong. Let's move on to Paul Porter. <laughs> Paul Porter is a waiter He's a co-waiter with Sam Server. He's worried, Dr. Landisman. He comes to you. You have never seen him before. He says, I'm worried. All this talk about AIDS. Why are you particularly worried about having AIDS? Is it because you've shared food with Sam or you've done other things with Sam? You mean, were we sexually intimate? Yes. No, no. Good friends, roommates. Do I have AIDS? My answer would be at that point, absolutely not. No. I mean, you've tested me for AIDS. Well, there is no test for AIDS. I think it's important to understand that AIDS is the last part, the most extreme manifestation of a, an infection with a virus. That virus is called HTLV3. And you can have that virus for many years without having AIDS per se. Mm -hmm. But what I read in the newspaper, there's all this talk about testing. You know, there is, there is a test which can reliably detect the presence of the virus that causes AIDS. Such a test does exist. Dr. Krim, what does the test tell you? The test detects the presence of antibody to the HTLV3 virus, which is the virus associated with AIDS. It does not directly detect the virus. If I test positive, is yeah. there a chance that it was wrong? There are several tests are available. The, more, the first one used on blood is called ELISA test. This test has a high percentage of, percentage of false positive results. When one has obtained a positive result on an ELISA test, one has to repeat it first of all and then use another confirmatory test called Western blot. It's unfortunately also more complicated to do and more expensive. But so poor Paul Porter, yes. when he's in the good doctor's office, yes. he's going to get confused very quickly. Yes. Well, it is uh, his doctor's obligation, responsibility, to explain exactly what the test means and to use it only when really called for. Dr. Galen, I would encourage my patients who have anxiety because I deal with anxiety. Take the damn test. I don't know what it'll do to me psychologically. I may become a, a basket case. I may be non-functional. 
You may indeed, but fortunately you have a very good psychiatrist. <laughs> And keep him coming back now. Right. Willing to extend the relationship. We have a contract of decency and honesty. I don't lie to you. I tell you, Paul, that even if you have doubts, the test as it now exists with the Western Bloc is about as good as any test we have. And if it says you test positive, you and I assume you are a carrier of the virus. Are you worrying about me or society? Well, I'm always only worried about you, but I hope that you're the kind of person that worries about society. But as an analyst, I have no responsibility for society except in the broad. But and you're, you're telling me it's better for me to know. We work with the assumption that the real world is better than the fantasy world. What makes analysis tough? Dr. Chen, public health, who should be tested? Individuals who have had multiple sexual partners, uh, in the past, especially at the, this time, homosexual partners. But not exclusively. Not exclusively. We would consider an individual at some risk if that individual has had multiple heterosexual partners because we are dealing with a sexually transmitted disease. Anybody who shares needles clearly would be an individual that would be at high risk to be infected. So these are the two main uh, risk groups. I think also sex partners of those individuals that we talked about sex partners of intravenous drug users, uh, sex partners of hemophiliacs uh, are all at risk. Mr. Dowdard, are there groups who should be required to be tested? No, I, I would have to bring out here the public health service recommendations, which uh, even apply even to a, a mythical town. And the recommendations there are that the test should be offered. It should made it be made available to those in the high risk group. It does not recommend that anyone actually be required to take the test. Mr. You know, Congressman, so I want protection. Public health ought to be reaching out to every American saying, if you don't have AIDS this morning, here are the three or four basic things you had better not do. And, you know, because you are literally risking your life. If you use a needle anybody else has used, you are literally risking your life. If you engage in certain sexual practices without, without very serious precautions, you are literally risking your life. And you can't trust the partner you met this evening at the bar to be honest, or even to be knowledgeable. You have to operate on an assumption that we now have in this, in this society a virus which at certain kinds of use is highly virulent. Since you can't quarantine 30 or 40 or 50,000 carriers, how do you functionally on a daily basis in effect functionally quarantine yourself by your practices from, the, from that virus? Now, I think we have literally followed exactly the wrong public health policy in not being emphatic enough and, frankly, frightening enough. Not about getting it from the waiter where you go, to, go, where you go down and have lunch, but saying adamantly and publicly and in 30-second spots as vividly as we can, if you engage from this day on in any of the following practices, you are not only stupid, you're potentially suicidal. Dr. Krim, how would you engineer the congressman? Well, first of all, I, I would um, tell him and, and our audience that the numbers of people infected already is much larger than 40 or 50,000. We're probably talking already in this country of between 1 and 3 million people infected, most of whom don't know they are, which is a very uh, dangerous uh, situation because uh, they cannot control or they, or they don't behave appropriately because they don't know they are infected. And what we're saying here is, to, is that we must speak uh, very seriously to the public at large, to everybody, and particularly to adolescents who are the kids in school who are more likely to experiment with drugs and sex. I'm a headmaster of the school. I invite you in to talk to the sixth graders, 11, 12-year-olds. Is that a good group? Yes. One should start then. What are you going to say to them? explain how sexual intercourse occurs, what are the organs, the body surface, that surfaces that are likely to be in touch with each other, and how blood from one person can go on pass to the other, or semen from a man can be passed on to somebody else. And you would have With diagrams and pictures. Yes, and what has to be done to stop the transmission? And this can be done 
to physical barriers, and these are condoms and diaphragms, and with the help, perhaps, of certain chemical preparations, germicides, that destroy the virus. So this country. should be taught to 6th, 7th, 8th graders. Before they indulge, yes, in sexual activity. Mr. And Mayor, are you willing to fund that program? Yeah, I'm willing to fund it. I don't know that uh, the uh, public will uh, accept it. It's very hard uh, to uh, get uh, parents uh, to accept explicit sexual explanations uh, at that uh, grade level, but I think uh, the doctor and the others, the congressman who spoke a moment ago, are absolutely uh, correct. How about the congressman? What are you going to do when you get 20,000 letters screaming about this immorality in the classrooms in Metropolis. I'm going to say, I think, very explicitly, I hope your 11-year-old doesn't die. I am willing to take extraordinary steps, not for sexual education on a non-value basis, to tell your child whether or not to engage in certain things, but on the very specific public health issue that your child needs to understand there are certain practices which could kill them, that are both, there are drug use practices that can kill them, and there are sexual practices that kill them. General Coop? Will federal funds be made available for this? <clears throat> federal funds are available for this. And you may know, sir, that even in this little town of Metropolis, that uh, <clears throat> my relatively meager fame has reached the ears of the president of this country. And uh, he has asked me to prepare such a message for the people of this country. And I am in the process of doing that now. I want you to be the script writer. You give me a 45-second, or thereabout, message, which the good Surgeon General, coming on camera, will read. What should it say? It should say, number one, it threatens everybody, potentially. Not only certain groups, as most people think. Number two, that it is a sexually transmitted disease and that it is transmitted through blood. Right, will you talk about avoiding anal intercourse? No, it's not necessary to uh, separate anal intercourse from other forms of intercourse. Since they are all dangerous, it's only a question of degree. To give you an idea of how that message doesn't get out, uh, we have a hotline in our hospital where we receive calls from people who are concerned that they may have acquired the virus. We get calls from suburban housewives who say, who say that I had sex with my husband yesterday in an unusual manner. Can I get AIDS now? We have to try to explain to them that it's not the type of sexual activity that's the key thing, but it's whom you have sex with. Because of this focusing on anal intercourse, because that is the dominant sexual activity that is involved in the gay community, people have tended to focus on that as a dangerous act. If you keep focusing on anal intercourse, what you do is you keep splitting off the homosexual community, letting the heterosexual population think well, it's them and that activity. Me with my nice, ordinary vaginal intercourse, I'm safe, I'm okay. And it creates an artificial barrier of them versus us. I think also you must include oral uh, genital contact. Not only just vaginal, anal, but oral must be in very explicitly and, and made in that. Uh, General Coop, you willing to deliver this message? I'd rather write my own. <laughs> <laughs> How different would it be? Well, I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first of five appearances I will make with you this week on the subject of AIDS. Uh, I know that many of you out there are panicky about AIDS. There are two general groups, those who are high risk, such as homosexuals and intravenous drug users. And I think that the more panicky you are, the better, because you will then pay attention to what we've said and you will alter your lifestyles and take care of your own problem. But for the rest of you panicky people, who are afraid you're going to catch AIDS <clears throat> at Leo's or walking through a hospital where there's an AIDS patient. AIDS will have to never be accused of seeking you out. You have got to seek it out. And for my final message tonight, until I get into specifics for the next four nights, the safest way to avoid AIDS is with mutually faithful monogamous sexual relationships of either sex. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. See you tomorrow. But isn't there a problem with that? How do you, I, for two people who are single, and they meet, and they fall in love, and they decide, let's have a mutually monogamous relationship, you still don't know whether one or, or both of those parties is infected. If you are that concerned about that monogamous relationship and that individual, 
you have available to you a testing situation, and then you can decide whether or not your love is so great it doesn't matter. And how realistic is it to assume that everyone in the society, given the divorce rate, given everything we know sociologically, how realistic is it to assume that people are going to engage in mutually monogamous relationships? Mutual can be just as difficult to deal with as the monogamous. I'll probably how do we make the assumption? I'll get into that make, Thursday. Can't we, isn't it safer from a public health standpoint to tell each individual how they can protect themselves irrespective of the behavior or the faithfulness or whatever or antibody status of their partner, how they can protect themselves. Isn't that the message that as, we need to give As a out? public health officer, I'll start with the biggest message I can give in the shortest time to the greatest number of people and protect them. Now, Tuesday night, <coughs> I will talk to the people who haven't heard me explicitly. And by Friday night, I'll get down to types of sexual contact, protective mechanisms, and so forth. And you don't think the networks will have a little difficulty with this? No, I don't think so. Not the things I've heard on networks recently. <laughs> Let me introduce you to uh, Paul Porter's sister, Linda. Uh, Linda is an intravenous drug user. Mr. Prem, what are we going to do for Linda? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, she should... Uh, uh, be called in and told about safe practices. Called if, in where? Well, she she's should, a wanderer. She's a wanderer, okay? Um, I personally uh, would like to take a mobile unit to that wandering station where they pick up their drugs on a daily basis, and I'm going to give out condoms uh, to that population so that they will be able to practice safe sex. I'm going to make available to them treatment right on the spot uh, so that they will not have to be in a waiting line or on a waiting list to get treatment. What kind uh, of treatment? Drug-free treatment or methadone maintenance treatment mm -hmm. or uh, naltrexone treatment, either one, a narcotic antagonist treatment. Doc, my friends and I are going to be shooting up tonight. If that's your rap, we've seen a dozen down here like you before. Well, if you're going to shoot up, make sure you use a clean needle and do not share your needle with anybody else. And if you, uh, uh, the way to clean your needle, uh, I would tell them exactly uh, the use of Clorox and, and, and water and a, and a high enough strength of Clorox to make sure that they get rid of the, of it's the virus. It's bad to share the needle. It's absolute, that... Absolutely. No sharing of any needle whatsoever. I, but you know, we, we don't have enough needles. then don't do it, okay? Uh, I have, my mayor is sitting here, and uh, we have had this discussion, and uh, I'm, I, I would uh, eventually probably want to recommend the use of, uh, or the, the uh, make needles available over the counter. You got some needles? Well, I wouldn't give them out, but I would... Uh, Why not? If, the, if this problem continues to go at the rate it's going, I would, I would begin to make needles available to people over the counter like it is done in other states. Mm -hmm. Free needles, not free. You'd have to buy them. And the needle would have to self-destruct. If we could have a needle that would self-destruct after each use, that you couldn't use it again, uh, then I would be all for making needles available immediately. If the problem continues to get out of hand and drug abuse continues to rise, like I'm seeing it in certain communities, then indeed I would recommend selling needles over the counter at this juncture. And, and why, why the selling as opposed to giving? That's just going to make it think, worse for the poorer. I, I don't think that we should uh, encourage drug abuse by making, particularly intravenous drug abuse, by making needles available to the public. And I think that's exactly what would happen make them easily available. The greater the availability of the substance, the greater the availability of the implements, the greater the use of those implements. But now we have another campaign on safe drug use with the possible selling of self-destructing needles. You're going to fund it, Mr. Mayor? Well, let me first uh, address the uh, substantive part of it. Uh, in Metropolis, uh, I received uh, from uh, the uh, health commissioner uh, a proposal uh, that uh, we eliminate the uh, law that uh, says that uh, hypodermic needles can only uh, be uh, purchased uh, with a prescription 
uh, and cannot be sold over the counter without one. And uh, the members of uh, the health department agreed with uh, the health commissioner and what I did uh, was I uh, sent it to every law enforcement official uh, in uh, Metropolis and every one of them opposed it. Uh, they uh, said uh, that any uh, drug user uh, who is bent on using uh, drugs is not going to go looking uh, for a uh, new needle uh, when uh, he or she uh, needs uh, drugs. And therefore, uh, they thought uh, that it would uh, simply be advocacy of drug use to uh, do this. I don't happen to have that position, but I know that until uh, the law enforcement uh, people change their position and adopt the medical position, which is what the health commissioner, I think, was overall uh, advancing, there is no chance in the world of getting legislators uh, in the state capitol uh, to uh, change the law and be accused of advocating the use of drugs. Could I add a, a little bit of realism to this discussion? As difficult as it would be to have a campaign about drug abuse, we have the networks refusing to take advertisements about contraception because they think that's too controversial. Despite public health ex experts like Dr. Coop, we have a Reagan administration that called for a cut of 20% of the funds to go to, to AIDS research and education at a time when we have an epidemic sweeping this nation. So we're all sitting here agreeing that the minimum we ought to inform the public, certainly the high-risk groups, the rest of the public ought to be informed as well. We're talking about using the media going to cost money that we don't see uh, this administration willing to spend, and it's going to require the cooperation of the networks that have been very, very timid in even talking about uh, contraception and running paid ads uh, for uh, contraceptive devices. Can't the media be encouraged to be less timid by both sides of the aisle? If the president enlists his allies, and there is a general consensus from, from the conservative movement, and they were to call in the networks and ask the networks to help on a public service basis. My guess is that you could lead this country an enormous distance in a year. These are the same people who don't want the spots on condoms on the air. Yeah, but they'll be very willing. <laughs> I mean, to have, they'll be much more willing. I don't think they'll have a problem with the networks because they'll be very willing to have uh, conversations about sex, and you might even be willing to have sex education in the schools as long as it was based on the notion that sex was dangerous and not based on the notion that sex was pleasurable. You'll find great support. If, yeah, from the standpoint of fundamentals, the purpose of the advertising is to make it relatively easier for 15-year-olds to go out and discover sex, if, from the standpoint of conservatives, the purpose of this whole project is to make it easier to become a drug addict, then there's going to be enormous resistance. But let me just say, and in the context of this discussion here today, when somebody walks in and says, hi, I am violating the law by being an intravenous drug abuser. I probably am paying for that by doing things that are illegal. I am totally unwilling to listen to any of your advice. And in a world where there are lots of other more decent, more, re more reasonable people who need help in a resource-scarce environment, I want you to focus on some extravagant and bizarre way of making sure I get the message. I have a little bit of difficulty worrying about that person. I, I think it's important to realize here, Congressman, that uh, drug addiction is a disease entity. And it's not necessarily one that one, uh, one might voluntarily get into it initially. And sometimes it's iatrogenic where people might get into it secondary to having taken drugs uh, for pain or whatever. You must treat that aid case no matter how that person got AIDS, if, whether it was through homosexuality or heterosexuality or whether it was through intravenous but, but drug me, use, just like we treat that person who needs a liver transplant. But let me take it. That's, that's what we must look at. He's a handicapped person. Dr. Dell? Yeah, I, I'd just like to say before we totally write off uh, IV drug abusers here, to point out that, that most of the pediatric AIDS in this country is through drug abuse either through the, the mother herself, who may be a drug abuser, or the father, who may actually pass the, the, the virus on to the mother. Seventy percent of the pediatric cases, uh, AIDS cases, are through drug abuse. Yeah, drug abusers don't exist in a vacuum. They are having sexual contacts. They are, they are potentially infecting other people. And in fact, if you are deeply concerned about the spread of AIDS into the heterosexual population, that is probably the window. Let me introduce you to the last member of the Porter family. <laughs> he's the youngest. His name is Christopher Porter. And he's about 17. And he comes to you, Dr. Galen, 
for counseling and says, Doc, you've been a friend of the family a long time. I haven't been sexually active. And the more I think about it as I grow older, the more I, I think that I'm gay. Could you talk to me about that? I'd be delighted to. And I'm glad that you came in when you're 17 and not sexually active. Now, first of all, you don't know that you're gay. It isn't a black and white, gay and straight. And your sexual identity hasn't been established. And whether you become gay or not may be more on the basis of whether you decide to or wish to. You don't have any indications that most of this is genetic. So you do have an option. That's the first thing you ought to know. The idea that this is sort of a God-given thing is one that is a misrepresentation. Plenty of young gay people uh, have come in for treatment and have become not gay. That's nonsense. That's not nonsense. I've treated plenty. Then they weren't gay in the first place. They may have been bisexual. Well, I'm talking to Chris How now. did you get into this consultation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm his conscience. <laughs> you are henceforth known as Levy the Greek Chorus. <laughs> um, I'm saying to you, Chris, you're young. A lot of young people do not know their sexual identity. But if you then want to go on and tell me that you have had a very active homosexual life up until now, and that your fantasies since you were four years old were all homosexuals, we might be talking a different story. And what? if either at the first or the fifth or fifteenth meeting, I say to you, I've decided I'm going to lead a homosexual life. I'd like to know on what you base the decision. Uh, has someone uh, talked you into this, or is this where your fantasies have led you? Are you trying to talk me out of it? I'm neither trying to talk you out of it or talk you into it. I want to know what your diagnosis is. It's a difficult one. It's not a diagnosis. It's a, could the Greek chorus ask the doctor a question? <laughs> when a 17-year-old kid comes in and says, I'm heterosexual, but I haven't had any sexual experiences, do you ask him why he knows that, how he knows that? Do you, ask, do you inquire as to what his homosexual fantasies might be? Do you ask him, I mean, why is the assumption when someone comes in and says to you that I think I am gay, that that might be wrong, but if someone comes in and says I think I am heterosexual, do you question that just as thoroughly? Do you explore with that person that it's quite possible that he also might be homosexual? Had you had the advantage of an interview with me, a therapeutic interview, I'd have asked you all of those questions, Good. independent of how you came. Now, I do make an assumption. There is a direction towards heterosexuality. Don't forget, very few people come into me saying, Doctor, I'm nervous. I'm heterosexual. Um, and I've had heterosexual <laughs> fantasies. So I wouldn't even bother questioning that. People come into me because of anguish or pain. If they come into me as a counselor and announce, that they think they may be with no experience, you're damn right I'm going to question what that means. If in the course of our meetings my direction is clearer and clearer and clearer, what should I look out for? Well, um, you live in a tough time, and heterosexual or homosexual, you know that we trivialize sex terribly. Uh, most young people find it easier to go to bed with each other than they do to get to know each other. Um, uh, it's easier. It's easier to fall into bed with someone and expose your genitals than to expose your thoughts. So I'd caution you about that. Now, sex isn't trivial. Uh, sex should be fun, uh, but it's serious. So I'd caution you about that. It'd be very little different if they were heterosexual or homosexual. Is this going to become a safe sex lecture? But you really come to me as a friend of the family, right. so I'll give Uncle you Will. Right. Uncle Will, okay. I'm happy with that way because as a psychiatrist, I hate giving advice. I don't like raising questions, but okay. So as Uncle Will, I'll say to you, Chris, look, uh, people are getting into trouble with sex. Uh, we're finding increased cancer of the cervix because of promiscuity. Fortunately, we have tests now so that it isn't malignant. We're rediscovering diseases like uh, a genital herpes, and then you know about AIDS, which is a disease. Uh, which is a terrifying uh, in its current uh, uh, occurrence and consequences. So you've got to be careful when you start your sexual life. Now, now, now Mr. Levy, if uh, Chris had come to you as the other friend of the family? <laughs> no. 
I think I would have asked very similar questions about how is he sure that he feels that he is gay, even if uh, without any experience. Would you give me warnings, though? I would certainly give you warnings, and I would certainly probably give the safe sex talk a little bit earlier than Uncle Will, because I think that part, you know, one of the... All teenagers at least fantasize about, if not act upon, some sort of sexual experimentation. And I think it is particularly dangerous in these times to be experimenting without taking precautions, and I think it can be very difficult, homosexual or heterosexual, to convince a teenager that they are not infallible, that they are not immortal. And I think they, will, they need to fully understand that these are much harder times to be experimenting with their sexuality. Despite two lectures by two great lecturers, <laughs> Chris, two or three years later, has come to you and gone through the testing, and he is antibody positive. I would have to tell him what a positive test means which is that a positive test, although it detects antibodies against the virus, probably means that he is infected with the virus and he is potentially infectious to others, principally by sexual means or by mixing of blood. And that gives him, that puts him in a very, very, very difficult uh, moral, ethical, and sexual dilemma. That means if he follows many of the normal instinctual urges that he now has in terms of expressing his sexuality, he can potentially infect somebody else. And that's a difficult thing to tell a 25-year-old uh, person, perhaps even a 45-year-old person. Um, Who are you going to tell about me? Are you going to tell Dr. Chin? No. I'm going to tell nobody. By telling anybody else about you, ultimately I defeat the broader purpose that, that I'm aiming at. And that is ultimately to try to, to help to protect the health of everybody. Again, if But I'm infectious. Perhaps. Yes, but if, I, if my goal is to protect society from people who are potentially infectious, and if I violate the confidentiality of somebody who is infectious, then nobody else will seek to find out if they're infectious. And as a result, my actions are going to be counterproductive. Time passes. Christopher is back in your office, Dr. Landisman. On his ankles are purple lesions, Kaposi sarcoma. What does that mean? Well, if he has uh, Kaposi sarcoma, then he meets the government definition of having AIDS. That means he has AIDS, and that means he has now progressed, or the virus infection has progressed down towards the more severe end of the, of the consequences of that infection, such that he is now he now has uh, what we call AIDS, and his outlook in terms of his life over the next uh, three years is, uh, is dismal. Do you tell anyone? If the public health law says that you must report cases of AIDS, then I would report the cases. To whom? To the public health authority, to the commissioner. Commissioner Chin, why do you want to know that I now, according to the government, have AIDS? The data with regard to reporting cases of AIDS was established back in 1982-83 uh, primarily to keep track of the infection and the disease experience in this country. So it's a matter of trying to monitor what's happening in the United States with regard to clinical cases of AIDS. Chris, having heard your rather depressing message, has now just reverted or has taken up what you would have to describe as a promiscuous lifestyle. He is not following the safe sex lecture. Life's too short, he would say if you asked him. He is frequenting places where sexual activity goes on. Somebody tells you about that, Dr. Chin. You get a message. Yes, we've had se several of those messages. What do you do? It's a very difficult uh, area. We try initially to counsel with other 
individuals who might be basically giving, capable of giving peer counseling. Now, now, gi now give me the mechanics of this. You receive word that Christopher Porter may be spreading AIDS. Well, we try to get uh, that person in. To you call me in. That's right. Try to call what Christopher in. Tell to try to convince the person that uh, what they're doing is harmful. Now, if that is not effective, then that we will try to refer that person to a support group who will also then try to give the same message. Now, if that fails, then I think we are in deep trouble because I think well, in we this... do not have any effective measure at the present time to I'm out there every night that with my knee-length socks covering the Kaposi sarcoma. What are you going to do about me, Christopher? Porter on the street, night after night. I would then ask the mayor to convene a legal group to determine what measures we might be able to take in the metropolis. Some health officer. <laughs> <laughs> the buck has been passed. Don't you have any authority? We have authority to general powers to isolate an individual. Isolate. That's isolate. A quaint euphemism for what? It's exactly what it is, to isolate. Would it be Detain. fair to say synonymous to quarantine? No, quarantine means you isolate a person until the symptoms either come or don't come. So there's a, when you quarantine a person, there's a finite limit to the isolation. Oh, and so it, isolation can be longer than quarantine. Absolutely. Like forever. Absolutely. For this particular problem. I am going down in history as Metropolis's first recalcitrant patient. You're going to try and take me into isolation? I would have to get a court order to place you in isolation, yes. Would you oppose or support that request for a court order? If the facts are as you describe it, I think we all recognize that in any public health crisis there is a need to deal with that occasional, and they are very occasional, recalcitrant. And as long as it is being done in a way that, that Christopher has a right to defend himself, and that the state has to go before a judge and prove that this is necessary, and this is indeed the, the very last resort and the only means at their disposal to deal with this issue, then I think it's very hard to argue against it. What one can argue against is a broad quarantine or isolation power that that does not go through all the various hoops that should be necessary before you deprive someone of their individual liberty. Although the court is smiling at the moment, the brow was very furrowed 30 seconds ago. You've got the health officer, you've got community groups coming in, and you've got Christopher Porter who says, I thought this was a free country. They want to put me into custody. He wants to put me in jail. He calls it isolation. Well, it would depend upon the authority under which he was acting. Uh, if he is exercising what we call police powers, um, which permits him to protect the, uh, the public health and the authority which confers uh, uh, the, the regulation or a law which confers upon him the authority to do what he's doing, if that has been uh, promulgated uh, with due regard for the, the, uh, the, uh, the public health concerns. Isn't this authority unconstitutional in a free society? No. No, the, the, um, uh, the, the powers conferred upon the, the state to protect the health and welfare of the citizen is known as the police power and that may be exercised in a reasonable fashion. Christopher Porter has come out of isolation. He has finally gotten the message from various people, promises to follow safe sex. I'm lying in bed one night watching television and Ms. Spencer brings me a report 
about some research being done on AIDS by Dr. Krim. Something called a compound K for Krim. <laughs> and it appears that some of the early results show it's stopping the virus. So I call up Dr. Krim. Doctor, could you get some of that compound K over here? I'm an AIDS victim. No, of course not. The first thing that has to be done with a compound like this is to establish um, convincingly that it is indeed effective against the virus in the laboratory, first of all, in test tubes and in animals. But and I, heard on, I heard on the news tonight yeah. that this may stop the virus. Yes, in the test tube and in animals. Then the next step is to try whether it is effective in human beings. Well, here I am. Okay. So there, there, there is an agency that regulates the use of new drugs in human beings, and that's the Food and Drug Administration. And it requires a certain amount of information of the, on the drug before allowing its experimental use in human beings. So, if and I call you back in a drug? week, will I be able to get it? Oh, no, it takes longer than that. A few months? Maybe a few weeks sometimes. Maybe a few weeks. Yes. I'm dying. Well, unfortunately, it takes some time. Mr. Deputy Commissioner, why can't I have compound K? I'm 25. I'm dying. If you want to have the last days of your life be uh, uh, more, contain more suffering, to in fact contain uh, fewer days, fewer hours, fewer availability of, of uh, consciousness, of uh, access to your, the loved ones that you, you share life with now? Do you want to, uh, the drug that we give you to, to, to cause you harm? What if it gave more meaning to my, to my death, to my disease, that if I could feel, even if I died a few weeks sooner by participating in this trial of this drug, I will have contributed some valuable knowledge that could have saved other people's lives rather than lying in a hospital an extra month and contributing nothing. I don't agree. I don't disagree with that. I think if we can we can expand the availability or access uh, to experimental drugs, that would be appropriate. We have to do so, always balancing the the possibility that we will be doing harm. Let me assume that risk. Stop being so damn paternalistic. We're not being paternalistic in this sense. If we gallop into this, uh, some of these uh, studies we can tell very quickly, a matter of weeks, literally, if the toxicity is a problem. Uh, certainly in a matter of months, it's going to be a problem. For us to uh, put you on a drug uh, uh, that's going to be highly toxic, that may be promising in other ways, but will be highly, could be highly toxic to you, is not fair to you as well. But about eight weeks later, he's back in. Second attack. What's my prognosis, Dr. Landsman? Very poor. Very poor. It's getting close, isn't it? Getting close. How close? Well, again, you can't predict that with, uh, with certainty, but probably one would say six months or less. Expensive. Highly expensive. How expensive? Well, estimates are anywhere from uh, $50,000 to $140,000 overall care for a person from the time of onset of disease to the time of, uh, to the time of death. In two years' time, between 70 and 80 percent of the beds in Metropolis's hospitals will be occupied by terminal AIDS patients. Well. In Metropolis, uh, we have taken the uh, position uh, that there uh, will be uh, acute care for every uh, AIDS patient. All of our uh, hospitals, municipal and uh, voluntary, participate. And uh, we estimate that when uh, Metropolis grows to be a city of 7.5 million, the expenditure will be $150 million dollars. Uh, of uh, all funds, uh, city, uh, state, and uh, federal, that we will be applying to an estimated AIDS population at that time of about five or 6,000 in just uh, Metropolis. So we don't think uh, that uh, you have to choose or must choose 
uh, between um, providing uh, the best medical care for uh, someone who is in uh, acute condition as opposed uh, to uh, saying we will provide little or no care and we'll take the money and we'll put it in uh, to uh, research. The reason we think that both are doable is uh, that the dollars involved are not so astronomical. General Coop? I think that many times people are critical of uh, how little they know about AIDS, not realizing how much we know about AIDS in a very short time considering how long we've known about AIDS. Uh, we've had uh, whooping cough with us forever. We know much more about AIDS than we do about whooping cough. We don't know as much as we'd like to do. And therefore, when someone says, what do you know? And we put in a but or an if or an apparently, they think we're hedging. Uh, I really think that the response of the private sector and of academia and of the government researchers toward all aspects of AIDS has been rather phenomenal for the very short period of time that we've been in, in, encountered this thing. The tragedy of AIDS poses a tough test for us all. How we manage with AIDS without a cure depends most of all on education, the knowledge of what AIDS is and what it isn't, and how we can stop it. Next week, we look at medicine and the complicated miracle of birth in a program called Technology Rocks the Cradle. Stay with us now for part two of the new masterpiece theater drama, Paradise Postponed, coming up next here on WETA 26. Tapes of the program are available. Write to Columbia University Seminars on Media and Society, Graduate School of Journalism, New York, New York, 10027. Columbia University Seminars on Media and Society is solely responsible for the content of this program. Funding for